All right, Queens, welcome to another episode. I have a special guest with me today. I have the incredible Dr. Laura Zib, and she is a psychologist and food freedom coach. Zara, Laura, I keep calling this wonderful woman Zara, and I don't know why. <laughs> Laura helps, helps women create a healthy relationship with food without guilt or emotional eating. So I'm so excited to have you on, Laura. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here as well. I've been listening to your podcast for ages, Victoria, and I just always get so much from it. And I think what you're doing is amazing. So I'm so honoured to be here today. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I know you have a lot to do on YouTube with your amazing videos. So obviously I will link everything below, but I would like you to share where people can find you first, because I like to have a little stalk of the person who I'm currently listening to. So if someone wants to give you a little stalk whilst they're listening to us chat, where can they find you? Cool. I guess the best places to find me are either on Instagram or YouTube, and I'm Dr. Lara Zib on both of them. Or you can find me on my website, which is also drlarazib.com. Awesome. All right. I've got 10 quick fire questions with you. I know I know that you knew this was coming, but of yes. course you don't know the questions. So I don't. are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go. Number one, sweet or savory? Savory. Number two, ideal holiday. Oh, that's so hard, but it's probably got to be beach focused. Yeah. Mm. And warm, beach focused and warm. Just to rub it in, I go to Egypt on the 13th of November. So, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm jealous. (laughs) (laughs) Number three, dogs or cats? Cats. Number four, oh, what do you love? What do I love? Oh, my husband, my children, I have to say that, don't I? I love sunshine, I love walking in nature, and I love Pilates. Oh, nice. What is your favourite food, number five? Oh, that's a really good question. It really depends on my mood. So if I'm going for a snack, and I said mm-hmm. favourite at the beginning, then salt and vinegar crisps, love them. Uh, but if I want something a bit more nourishing then I love a stir fry oh what's your favorite sauce to have with a stir fry we need details details (laughs) soy sauce or teriyaki oh I'm teriyaki girl or sweet and sour Mm. yeah all right number six okay this might be a bit challenging but I'm going to ask you anyway what is the most ridiculous thought you ever remember having (laughs) Oh, so many. Where would I start? I mean, we're going to talk about this, obviously, because um, I'm going to share my story a bit. But I think all the really ridiculous thoughts I've had revolve around being so entrenched in diet culture. So this thought that I'm not worthy because I'm not thin enough or pretty enough or funny enough or that whole like, I'm not enough. So I would say it's that. Yeah, I love that you brought that up as the most ridiculous thought because (laughs) I feel you, but most people think that Mm. it's true and we're going to go into why it's not. So hang fire, listeners, it's coming. All right, number seven, if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would that be and why? Oh, that is such a good question. (laughs) Um, Dead or alive? I mean, I, I, I probably, when I was younger, I, I read all, um, a lot of people's like, biographies. So people like Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. So those would be definitely two people that I would love to sit down with. But I think more recently, I've gone towards being more inspired by females and females who are sort of changing the world. And I feel like there's so many that I would sit down. I'd love to sit down with Oprah one day and have a chat mm-hmm. with Oprah just to, you know, see what she's like um yeah so Oprah Oprah's a biggie it's a good one (laughs) yeah uh number eight your favorite thing about coaching oh I think for me it's probably the transformation Mm -hmm. like when you even the process that people go through but definitely when when you have a chat with people and they say well this is where I was And this is the transformation that I've experienced. And this is where I am now. Seeing that transformation, that's the, that's the most amazing thing I would say. 
Yeah, I agree. And the opposite to that, what's the most challenging thing you find about coaching? So I coach in a very specific area focused on food free freedom. And the most challenging thing I find is how entrenched people still are in diet culture. So some people who I've worked with who've never really allowed themselves to look past the whole idea that in order to be healthy, they must lose weight. And I think for some people, it's kept them stuck. So they haven't been able to move forward. So that it would be that. Mm, I completely agree with you. Like I'm copying mm. both of your answers to that because <laughs> it's so, so like heart wrenching when you know you can help someone, but they mm. have to be ready, right? They have yeah. to be ready to make that step. And we know yeah. what's on the other side and we want mm. that for everyone. So exactly. Last question. I'm grateful that we're having this conversation today, Lara. Why did you say yes to coming and being a guest on my podcast? Oh, it's probably what I said to you earlier is how I found your podcast just really inspiring. I love your approach. And I love the fact that you talk about all about the idea that binge eating is a result of restriction. So I really admire what you do. I think what you do is so important. And I think we need more women like you doing what you're doing so I'm just really honored to be here today <laughs> thank you I'm excited to dive in so first of all I would love for you to you know share a bit about your story I've obviously done my research around you and we've got to know each other a little bit anyway mm. you've struggled with eating disorders in the past can you just mm. share a little bit about Laura's Laura's life yes for sure so I would say my experience includes two eating disorders. So if you sort of rewind back to my mid teens, that's when I started dieting. And it was very much, I felt unworthy. I remember getting comments from people about, and, and I, was, I was slim and sporty at the time. But I remember someone commenting on the size of my thighs and I started to just really be very conscious of my body. And that's what got me thinking, you know what, I think I'm going to go on a diet. And it was what everyone was doing. So all the adults I knew around me, uh, my mom, my aunts, they had dieted. So it felt like a really natural thing to do. And I remember looking through magazines and thinking, well, that seems like a good one. So I did all the fatty diets. I did the cabbage soup, the fat free when fat free was a thing, very low calorie Atkins. And then that process of being on those diets led to very disordered eating and I remember a period of time at school where I was eating I was surviving on an apple and a yogurt a day I was kind of hiding like hiding my eating behavior and so I was really focused on restriction mm. but then eventually that led to me not being able to restrict as much as I wanted to and that led, led to binging and then purging so I I didn't realize it at the time but I basically was um oh it took me a while to realize that I was actually bulimic and it became something that was part of my life for quite a few years I would binge and then purge and I was someone I know we've chatted before um I was someone that could make myself throw up so I would binge on a lot of food and then throw up and that was what my sort of early 20s looked like but I kind of knew that there was something wrong and I knew I didn't want to stay like this. And so I went out and sought um, eating disorder and nutrition counseling. And I also had a very supportive uh, partner who's now my husband. So, and he was the only person that I told, or he'd kind of, he must've known what was going on. He kind of knew what was going on. And that was, he was really instrumental. And so was that counseling in helping me to change. And then I had this period of time when I was really comfortable in my own skin. I had real food freedom for a while, but then I got pregnant and I had my babies and going through that period of, um, you know, body change, I really struggled with it. And whilst, and, and there's, there's so much, isn't there of like, get your body back. You're going to bounce back nine months out, nine months down. And I was, yeah. I was obsessed. I was obsessed about getting my pre-pregnancy body back and my pre-pregnancy weight back. And I, and I knew I would never go back to diet because I had had that experience and I didn't want to fall back into the restrict and binge. But what I did do is I fell into wellness culture 
And I now look back on it, um, I was definitely experiencing, I was going through a period of orthorexia, but at the time I had no idea that that's what I was doing because it was that period of time where there was all these gorgeous glowing um, influencers and they were saying, cut out this for health and you know, gluten is bad for you and dairy is inflammatory and you mustn't have this and you mustn't eat there, that. And without really realizing it, I was slipping back into like real restriction, but I was doing it under the guise of health. I was like, this is for my health. Mm. It really felt like the right thing to do. I was so entrenched in wellness culture that I didn't really see that I was, I was dieting basically. I didn't see it for that. Um, and so I definitely was experiencing orthorexia because I was becoming so extreme and so obsessed about clean eating and no sugar. And then it was a sort of a series of things that happened that made me realize what I was doing. And but partly I actually, whilst I was in the throes of my, um, my orthorexia, I was training to be a health coach. And Although most of what I learned as a health coach was very entrenched in like a well weight centric approach. I did learn about health at every size. And I also learned about intuitive eating. And that was my first kind of exposure to those things. And I'm sad to say it took me a while to actually, you know, change my focus. But for the first part of my health coaching, I was really focused on health. Like, I guess, let's get you healthy, which often for most people, they were saying they wanted to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And so there's me orthorexic, teaching people how to get healthy. Um, and it was only after a while that I was like, mm, this, this is just not feeling right, because a lot of people were saying that they would feel healthy for a while. And then they were telling me about you know, they bake themselves some sweet potato brownies and then eat the whole, whole tray because it was healthy mm. or that they were, they'd be able to be really good for a week, quote unquote good, a week. And then they'd find themselves binging. And then I was like, gosh, that's the kind of behavior that I was engaging in when I was bulimic. Mm. Um, and then I realized that I needed to change my focus. And I just dived into reading everything on, intuitive eating health at every size got really into like the sort of non-diet approach and just completely shifted my focus stopped being orthorexic um and just completely shifted everything really so now my coaching is very much focused on food freedom coaching yeah wow what a journey and yes. I want to go and touch on a few points so the first thing I want to touch upon is I loved what you said around when you started to restrict back in the day mm. and then you could restrict for pretty long yeah, and yeah. then inevitably the binges were going to come. Yeah. I want to stay there because speaking from experience, speaking from experience from every single woman I've had the pleasure to mm. work with and maybe a lot of women listening now, what we think we need is more willpower yeah if only I could stick to it like I stuck to it xyz years mm -hmm. ago so there's something wrong with me because I used to be able to do it but now I can't but that's the lie isn't it yeah. because yes at the beginning especially if you've not dieted before and you're kind of experimenting with oh I'm gonna diet lose a bit of weight it kind of feels not easy but you're on a roll, you're kind of nailing mm. it, you're seeing the weight loss, everything's ro rainbows and sunshine. And then, of course, the binges come. Yeah. Um, because any form of restriction creates an equal and yeah. opposite reaction. So the harder you're restricting, the harder the binges are. Yeah. So do you see it in your coaching as well when women come to you and they just think, I need more willpower? Yes. <laughs> they do I need more will willpower I just need to do one more diet I just need to lose the weight and then I can focus on food freedom all that kind of wording and absolutely you see that restrict binge cycle and add a whole load of like guilt and feeling like a failure into that cycle and, and you're and you're so right because this is my personal experience and experience with clients is that you do those first couple of diets and you feel amazing because you're like this is working like I'm actually losing a bit of weight or like my my jeans feel feel a bit looser like this is this is awesome mm -hmm. and then eventually the binges come just like you say like even if it's not a because some of my binges were like really 
just frenetic and like just as much as I possibly could and others it's just you know you end up eating loads of stuff that you've restricted so it's like rather than having a salad for lunch today I'm going to eat two sandwiches so you know you're eating the stuff that's off plan quote unquote and then you feel really guilty and you feel terrible about yourself oh my gosh I failed again I just can't stick to anything I need more willpower it's okay the diet starts tomorrow I'm going to start all over again and I think the problem is that people get stuck in this cycle and really there's no way out because Mm. biologically it's your body saying we don't want you to be starving with yourself we want you to be feeding and nourishing yourself and so that's what's happening there it's not about willpower it's about what your biology is doing exactly and biology will always win eventually exactly because you're fighting against like your actual hormones it's like if I said to you or anyone listening I will pay you a million pounds if you can hold your breath for half an hour yeah and then people laugh and then I'll and I'll say would you take it and then they'll be like well of course I would try but their biology would take over and they would automatically breathe. And that is not a dramatic comparison to dieting and food because we need food to live Mm -hmm. and our bodies don't understand that there's Tesco down the road. Yeah. Even though we know our cupboards are full, your body sees lack of food and then freaks the fuck out and then drives you to eat. And that's exactly hello diet binge cycle. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And I also loved um, your honesty with the wellness Mm. kind of guys. And this isn't to say I just want to put a like, put it out there. I am not slating anyone who is promoting wellness, because I honestly believe Mm. those people are doing it from a place of love and it's worked for them and they want to share it for others. However, it can be so problematic, as you found for yourself, because you're doing it for, quote, bunny rabbit ears, quote, health. Even health has got a bit of a, a negative kind of sense with mm. it because of what the diet industry have used around yeah. health. But any kind of restriction is a diet. Yeah. And that creates a reaction. So, yeah. And I think the thing that I see, and I, I agree with you because I know people who are still very much in wellness culture mm. and, you know, pe- people do. And, and I say the same, like, you know, I don't think you're a bad person if you want to diet because that's what you've been told to do. And it's the same with in Mm. wellness culture. But I think you're right. What has happened with wellness culture is they've taken information. So like, for example, gluten is not good for people who are celiac or have issues with their digestive system or autoimmune conditions. And there is like scientific research to back that up. Yeah. But then what people have done is they've taken that information and they've extended it and said, well, oh, we actually think everyone should give up gluten because it can damage your gut lining. Yes, it can damage your gut lining if you have a medical condition, which means that it will damage your gut lining. Yeah. But for a lot of people, it's not going to, and therefore you don't need to give up gluten. So I think that's where we need to be a little bit careful. So I always say to people when I'm talking about restriction, I say, if you have a medical reason to restrict gluten or, you know, maybe you have a lactose intolerance intolerance and you can't have lactose or a nut allergy, so you can't eat nuts, then you should restrict. Absolutely, you should restrict. But if you have no medical reason, there's no reason why you should, then actually we want to think more about what you can add to your diet Mm. rather than what you should take away from your from what you're eating yeah it's like health mongering isn't it and I'm I'm not saying they're all doing it on purpose but I remember the coconut oil phase like a couple of years (laughs) ago one minute coconut oil is the best thing in the world and literally drink it put it on your hair put it on your skin do everything Mm -hmm. with it Mm -hmm. and the next minute it's going to cause cancer and no wonder people are sat there in the diet binge cycle because they're given so much different information yes that ironically is scientifically backed up whatever like a statement you go to this is the scientific research to back it up so no wonder people are confused about what the hell am I supposed to eat (laughs) so true so true yeah (laughs) but our bodies know best don't they Yeah. yeah What's the most ridiculous diet you've ever done? Because I like to have a bit of fun with this. Yeah, so this is this is such a good question. When you asked that, I was like thinking about um, the diets that I've done. So 
by far and away the most ridiculous diet I did. I was probably about 16 or 17 years old. And I actually did this with my mum and my aunt. I think my aunt did it with us. And basically you were allowed unlimited tea and coffee and water every day. But Ooh. it was only a four day diet, but yeah. you, you were only allowed one food on each of those days. So on day one, you were only allowed potatoes. Day two, you were only allowed tomatoes. Day three, <laughs> only chicken. And day four, only potatoes again. So you can imagine what it was like eating boiled potatoes for oh breakfast. My God. It was supposed to be some sort of miracle, you know, thing that you would lose a certain amount of weight in four days, like quick fix, mm. fad um, diet. But yes, that is my most ridiculous diet to date. <laughs> that is so funny. It reminds me of one I used to do and it used to call, be called the 10 day diet. And I have my little login and everything and I'll do it. I'd do it for 10 days. And of course, then I'd fall off the wagon and I'd do it again mm. for 10 days. And that was something really weird, like something similar to yours. Like one day you could eat eggs and cabbage. Then the next day you could have like a sausage, though. <laughs> it was really <laughs> random. <laughs> it was so random. And I can laugh about it now. And by the way, anyone who is stuck in that, and obviously it's not funny, ha ha, we're laughing about it now, looking back yeah, in hindsight. It's not funny when mm. you're going through that and you're desperately doing these ridiculous yeah. things, trying to find the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I would love to dive into a statement I found on your website. This really kind of, I would say upset me, but it drives me even more to do the work that Mm. we do. The average woman spends 17 years of her life on a diet, struggling with weight, emotional and binge eating. 17 years, like that is not okay. No, I think it's, yeah, it's awful when you think about how, and then that's the average woman. So obviously if you Mm -hmm. think about it, that's an awful lot of people will be spending a lot more time And it really is sad to think that. And, you know, when I think about my personal experience, I was I probably would count up maybe like 13, 14 years of my life on a diet. And I work with people who are sort of late 20s in their 30s and and 40s as well. And by that stage, I've worked with quite a few clients who have dieted for over 20 years of their life. And one of the things I get to do with my clients is get them to really think about like how much actual time have you spent dieting? Like how much time have you spent thinking about food, counting calories, reading labels, counting macros, maybe like monitoring your Fitbit or worrying as well, worrying about, like I remember worrying so much, like worrying about what was I going to eat when we go to that restaurant and what am I going to eat when we go to that friend's house because they're serving dinner and they're probably not going to be able to do something that's gluten-free and dairy-free and everything else that I was following at the time. Mm-hmm. and all the time that you spend like in my early days of dieting the amount of time I was spent flicking through magazines like looking at people and thinking actually I really wanted to look like Cindy Crawford that was my like <laughs> that's what I was aiming for I want to be Cindy Crawford we spent so much time worrying about our bodies and food and I always think like can you mm-hmm. imagine how incredibly powerful women would women would be if they weren't so consumed with trying to be a certain size it's nuts yeah. to think about. I, one of my most recent clients said to me very recently, and she was like mind blown. She's like, now I'm not scared of any potential weight gain, which is the root cause to, to like 99.9% mm-hmm. of diets and body yeah. issues, is the fear of weight gain, not necessarily the weight yes. gain that will come, the fear yeah. of the possibility of it becoming a thing. When she said, I'm no longer scared of that, then she was like, oh my God, what the F am I going to do with my life? Like I've got a complete blank canvas and loads of headspace to do whatever I want. And so she's doing all these amazing things that she amazing. used to want to do. And then she would say, I'll do that when I've lost the weight. I'll do that when I've lost weight. And she's yes. like, no, I'm living now. Yeah. So we do spend a hell of a lot of time worrying, yeah. counting, just a great question, Laura. Like, just imagine if you didn't have that in your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it's unimaginable for some people. It is, yeah. And you're yeah. right, because it takes up it takes up energy. It's like mental, it's emotional. It's like, 
it's it's almost like worry on so many different levels isn't it and then yeah. and take that away and you're like whoa I've got so much time in my life yeah and I also found throughout this process um of course when I say I'm quote healed I am but it's always a spectrum that you're never like healed with a tick and a gold medal and off you go like forever free yeah I'm at the very end of the spectrum towards complete food freedom, body freedom, all of those things, which I'm so grateful for. Throughout this journey, this spectrum that I was on, I used to get really confused. First of all, if I looked back to my restriction days, for four years, I managed to keep a very lean physique. So then I would start questioning, yeah, but diets do work because I managed Mm. to stay lean for four years. And then if you look at all the research, it's between two and five years. Yeah. When pe- when we're saying diets don't work, yes, if you it will work for a week or a month or even a yeah. year, but then long term they don't work. And then of course after all of that restriction, I rebelled completely mm-hmm. the same way that I'd restricted. And also what I realized is I I like chasing the dream of the perfect body. So yes. even though we're saying you know like you'd have so much space and room when you when you let go of all this, I don't know about you, but I did have to mourn the loss of my ideal body. Of course, that's a big one, but I had to let go of the chasing the dragon type of, Mm -hmm. because you have this vision in your mind and even though you're not there yet, it's like a dream that you're gonna, it's like a control thing, isn't it? Other than just being like, this is my body. This is where I am. And I accept that. That's hard. Yes, it is. It's funny because I think actually, pregnancy for me has helped with that process because um your body changes and you have you know you go through pregnancies you've got your kids and I think for me having my kids at the end of it I'm like my body went through huge changes but it was for very good reason so that's actually really although that I struggled with that to begin with as I've gone through that healing process through orthorexia that's Mm. actually really helped and I'm like it you know it's normal for a body to be different after you've carried babies and you've breastfed of course it's going to be different to what it was like you know before I got married like of course so yeah that helped you what yeah really did if you was to talk about like a mindset shift or one or a few mindset shifts that you would give someone who is stuck in the diet binge cycle is maybe listening and watching this thinking yeah that makes so much sense like what what step would you encourage them to take first if they're Mm. like at the start of their journey yeah that's such a good question I would say the very first step or mindset shift to go through is to separate the idea that health equals weight loss or a certain size or that you can just look at someone and and know that they are healthy or not because I think like you've just said like that is the that is a nub of so many reasons why people want to lose weight because at the moment we're told lose weight to be healthy or you must be a certain size or get thinner so I love to go through a lot of and I think people help people like to know some of the research behind it and I'm like Mm. you may have been told dieting is good for your health but actually it's not true I go through some of the biology I know we've really shared you know what actually happens to your body the hormone hormonal changes and things Mm. actually a lot of the research now that's coming out and this is recent research in the last five years showing that things like yo-yo dieting is actually really bad for your health and yeah. like a lot of the long-term studies are showing that there's an increased risk of death even, which obviously, you know, people don't be alarmed. Like yeah. you, can, you can stop doing, you know, stop weight, yo-yo dieting, that goes away. But it's really bad for your mental health as well. So that long-term dieting can be so bad for, we've already talked about, you know, increase in um, binge eating but it causes stress it's related to things like low low self-esteem and that kind of thing so the very first thing for me is about helping people realize that those two things aren't linked and then other research that I always go through is this idea that, you know at the moment society tells us that if you are a certain weight you're going to have really great health outcomes mm. but actually again a lot of the research that's coming out that shows 
cardiovascular health is much better. So you can be, and I use this not in a derogatory term, but in a descriptive word, but fat, but fit. And actually the research shows that fat, but fit people have much better long-term health outcomes than people who are thin and unfit. So a lot of like researchers, scientists are saying you should focus on, yeah, your fitness rather than your weight. And I think being able to decouple and separate that idea that you must lose weight to be healthy is so much better. And then you can start focusing on health promoting behaviors without thinking about them being part of weight loss, thinking about them as actually supporting your health in the long term. Yeah, so key. And I love that you brought that up because I used to think, I used to say, I'm on a diet to be healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I can't even say the word healthy like a normal person because it's not to be healthy because if you generally care about your health and I know mm-hmm. it is lack of information like you yeah know, and the people like you and I can share this the truth yeah. like Linda Bacon has I think Linda but she's now Linda Linda Bacon has a great book health at every size mm-hmm. which I'm sure you've read yeah love that book. Um, such a great book and I am classed as almost obese if I was to use BMI I literally weighed myself a couple of weeks ago because I wrote an article about um, how to achieve health um, without dieting. And I also wrote an article about um, health at every size, weight set point theory. And I thought, you know what? I've not weighed myself for so long. I mean, because I don't need to, I don't need a scale yeah. to tell me if I'm yeah. okay or not. I know I'm, I feel healthy. And I just curiously thought I'd get on the scales. Um, this is a bit of a trigger warning for anyone that gets triggered by mm. numbers, but I've I feel it's worth sharing. I'm five foot three, so I'm quite short, and I weigh 11 stone nine. So BMI, I'm almost 30, which apparently is obese. And I'm my hot resting heart rate's like 38 beats a minute. <gasps> That's amazing. So I'm so fit. I've got a lot of muscle tissue, like my omega three to six ratio is really good my blood sugar levels, all those things that we can work towards to be Mm. quote healthy, like actually healthy. Whereas if someone just looked at my BMI, they would think I was like very unhealthy and that's not true. Yeah. So when we can separate health and weight, yes, absolutely. how do you help clients do that? Because don't clients still want to lose weight? (laughs) Yeah. So I, the process that I go through actually starts way before that, because I think the very first step is really about ditching diet culture to begin with. And I think it's very, because so back when I used to work as a health coach, we'd jump in immediately of like, you know, how can you eat more healthily? And I think that that needs to come last. What you need to do is think about that first ditching diet culture, see how diets have impacted you, um, understand the whole like body image thing. Like the reason you have a negative body image is because diet culture wants you to have a negative body image. Because if you didn't have a no- negative body image, you wouldn't have gone on 10 diets. So it's helping people go through that process, understand how diet culture has impacted them. Then the next step that I take people through is about helping them tune into their body because diet culture se- separates, separates that. So it separates us from our intuition, our ability to tune into our bodies. We've forgotten what it feels like to, you know, be full um, or we think that feeling full is bad. We don't know what our hunger cues are because we've been so, we've ignored them for so long. We're probably, and I used to do this, like if you're a binge eater, you should, like shovel food into your mouth and you don't sit and appreciate it and taste it we've lost touch with our eating process and that mindful eating Mm. and then it would only be then I I work a lot with intuitive eating helping people to tune into that but I don't honestly don't think you can do that intuitive eating properly until you've ditched diet culture and you can reconnect with your body and then then it would be focusing on setting goals that are nothing to do with weight so that's when it's separating the you can still be healthy and this is why I talk about health mindset so much it's like you can still have health promoting behaviors without wanting to lose weight so you can you and and you know for some people they might lose weight other people might not but 
if you currently never do any movement whatsoever, and then you start walking, doing a bit of yoga, doing whatever it is that you like, that might improve your, you know, you've talked about vital statistics, it might improve your blood pressure, it might improve um, your resting heart rate, it might improve all those kinds of things. So it's about thinking about what do you want? And often, you know, people say, I want to lose weight, but actually, there's a reason below that. So maybe it's because they want to, they've got children or grandchildren they want to be able to run around after their kids and not feel out of breath or they want to be able to run walk up the flights of stairs without feeling breathless or they want to be able to go to a dinner party and not feel triggered and end up binging because they've broken their diet there's so many things that people have as their actual goals but they just say oh I want to lose weight so a lot there's a big process in it but most of all it's about helping people separate those two things that you don't need to lose weight to be healthy. We can do a whole host of other things to help you achieve health, basically. And for those of you who are still hoping for weight loss, which let's be real, you live in this culture, it's always going to be in there Mm -hmm. somewhere. I loved what you said, and it is also true, and this isn't any promises, but weight loss can be a Mm -hmm. byproduct of health with from a from a weight neutral mentality which is exactly what you were sharing with mindset and and it's very very similar process to what I go through as well Laura because if people try to jump to oh let's achieve health from a weight neutral perspective but they've not done all the work to ditch diet culture to tune into their body to learn how to eat intuitively it's just going to be in another diet yeah exactly or it becomes something like the the hunger and fullness diet or they get so obsessed with eating for nutrition and I'm like no 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 (laughs) yeah and one thing I want to share before we go into one of my favorite topics which is sugar is um something that I like to share is a lot of and this is usually the fitness industry that share this and I understand why but they usually say you know food is fuel for Mm. your body which yes it is but food is also pleasure because if it's like sex if you to have sex you make a baby but if you only had sex to have an actual baby yeah missing out on a whole lot of pleasure and fun in the meantime exactly food is pleasurable and it's okay to eat a brownie just because you want to taste the brownie absolutely absolutely and I think food can be so many things food can be connection connecting with family and friends it can be nostalgia like you know sometimes eating things that I used to eat as a kid it brings back all those emotions it 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 can be so many things I think and we forget that when we just think about food is fuel or you just think about the nutrients you think you know I'm eating this amount of carbs or this amount of protein it's like you're missing the point satisfying enjoying exactly that and let's move on to sugar then so I'm mindful of your time as well so don't worry about that (laughs) sugar so I love asking professionals such as yourself do you think sugar is addictive which is what some scientists are telling us and Mm. why or why not let's dive into that a little bit so I'm going to dive straight into this and say no I don't believe that sugar is addictive um and I always say that I, I do firmly believe that, that different foods have different nutritional values. So I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, it would be wonderful if someone just sucked lollipops all day long. Um, but I think the whole concept of sugar is addictive is really flawed. And if you go, so obviously I always go back to the research as I keep talking about research in this episode, but If you look at the where that idea came from, so there's two bits of research that have been used to say, yes, sugar is really addictive. So the first one was a piece of research that was done rats. And I always say to people, but where we are not rats. (laughs) No. And that particular piece of research was actually looking at whether rats could become addicted to cocaine. Mm -hmm. So it went in with a different angle and, and perspective. And actually in their research, They actually talk about previous research that has been studied on primates. And I feel like primates are more similar to humans than rats are. The primates found cocaine to be more addictive than food. So that's, you know, and I still think we're not primates. So, you know, quite frankly, they need to do the research on on sugar. 
Um, but then the other bit of, oh, sorry, not on sugar, on humans, the other bit of research that people always talk about is that when you eat sugar, it lights up the same neuro, neural pathways in your brain as have, taking a line of Coke. Mm. And so then people draw the conclusion that sugar is just as addictive as cocaine. But again, the thinking is really flawed in this, because if you delve in a little bit deeper, those same neural pathways light up when we do lots of things so have sex we just talked about that when we eat other food as well not just sugar and things like when we stroke puppies so when we're happy so we need to be very careful about drawing a conclusion that sugar is addictive just for those reasons because I think the thinking is flawed it's like people have gone one plus one Mm -hmm. equals and they've ended up with three and then they're saying yes this is true and we must never eat sugar And actually, in my personal experience and also in all the people that I've worked for, I think it's the restriction that causes the sugar cravings. I've never craved sugar so much as when I was restricting it. I Mm -hmm. wanted to eat sugar all the time. And your very first question to me was like, sweet or savory? I'm actually a savory girl. And I've discovered that because I don't restrict. In our house, we have tubs of ice cream. We've got biscuits. We've got sweets. We've got chocolate. I do love a bit of chocolate. But I don't go for any of the other stuff because I'm not that fussed about it. I'd much rather have a packet of crisps. So I think we can only work out what our relationship with sugar is when we allow ourselves full access to it anytime we want. And I, so I firmly, firmly believe that sugar is not addictive in the way that mm-hmm. people say that it is like cocaine. Oh, my God. What a great <laughs> answer thank you so much for clarifying all of that I agree sugar is pleasurable and like the senses in the brain like you shared yeah when you stroke a puppy when you have sex when like and I also believe you cannot be addicted to something you need in order to survive yeah and sugar is a carbohydrate yeah and so yes I believe there are some people surviving on keto but they're still eating sugar in the form of even the very smallest minute vegetable yeah. Yeah. which is a carbohydrate. So we need it to survive. So therefore we cannot be addicted to it. And yeah. I had a very similar experience to you. I genuinely thought I read all the books. I like almost went to like a 12 step program of like, hello, my name is Victoria and I'm addicted to yes. sugar. I took it that far because I generally believed I was, but funnily enough, the abstinence model caused me to crave it more than ever to the point where I would get maple syrup and drink it oh wow not the actual bottle so if that's not my body saying to me Mm. hey you need to eat like more sugar and so when I started this journey I was scared of how much sugar I was eating I'm not even gonna lie I was genuinely Mm. concerned how much chocolate I was eating and thankfully I had a great coach and she just said you know if that's what your body wants, mm-hmm. just trust the process. And I was like, yeah. how the fuck can I trust this when I'm eating like three kilograms every week? Yeah. Of but I trusted the process, kept facing my fears. And lo and behold, now there's loads of chocolate downstairs. I have bits when I want it. And I mm-hmm. never thought I would be able to be that person who had chocolate in the house and just had a yeah. bit when I wanted it. Yeah, same as that. And I think... By allowing yourself that ability to eat stuff, you can work out what you actually like. Because one of the things I used to binge on as well was ice cream. Mm. And I actually have realized I don't like ice cream. Like I genuinely don't like it. And it's so interesting. I, because I was restricting it, I then binged on it. I thought I'd be obsessed with it when Mm. I was also going through like nutrition counseling. They also helped me face my fear foods and I thought I was just going to eat ice cream all the time and then I realized I don't eat ice cream all the time just not that fussed about it yeah (laughs) it's amazing that magic word allowance gives us so much it really does and I'm I'm just looking at the questions I have for you Laura I'm going to ask you two more because I want to be mindful of your time so okay so the first one of two This ties in with another one. So I'm going to ask you this one because it ties into both. The fear of weight gain is totally, is is a thing, right? The fear of weight gain is obviously stopping most people from starting their food journey. 
body acceptance comes into that and ties into that so well what tips would you give um someone to start accepting their body Mm. and maybe to and again this is kind of two tied into one maybe to soften the fear of potential weight gain yeah it's um it's such a difficult process I think and I I would say to people you will probably find this hard it will probably bring up a lot of emotions as you go through this journey of body acceptance I think the very first again I always go back to diet culture helping people realize that a lot of their thoughts about their body are because of diet culture Mm. we are taught not to accept our bodies if you watch kids run around with that wanton abandon like I think about my daughter who's seven she delights in her body like she loves the fact that she's got legs to run around and they never worry about dimpled thighs or anything like that so they see their bodies as something that allows them to do things so definitely part of body acceptance is realizing that we can unlearn what we've learned through diet culture and then the other thing the other process I take people through is helping them understand and I did briefly mention this that diet culture teaches us to hate our bodies and that the society's body standards now are not the same as they were in the 70s 80s or 90s it's constantly evolving constantly changing and the reason for that is to help up is it means that we're always stuck in realizing we're not good enough our bodies yeah. aren't good enough so part and it, but if you go back sort of 200 years or more still other beauty standards existed so I actually think it's a very powerful and and quite countercultural thing to start accepting your body because the more we move away from society's beauty standards and realize that we're worthy as we are it's powerful so just mm-hmm. like we were saying earlier you will spend less time worrying about what your body is like and then I also think that we need to be aware or when we get to body acceptance of the things that we're saying to ourselves. So self-talk is a huge thing, huge piece. Often people don't realize how negative they are about themselves. So it's a process I went through as well. Look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, I look so fat. I'm like, this is wrong with me. That's wrong with me. All these things. So I get people to work through you know, understanding what their self-talk is like and whether they can be a bit more kind to themselves. That whole idea of if, you, if you're not going to say it to a friend or mm. your child or a colleague, then don't say it to yourself. And then getting to body acceptance, I get people to think about one thing, like just start with one thing you like about your body. And it, it can be your eyelashes or your nose or your fingernails like it can be anything and start with that and be grateful and then moving on to being grateful like focusing on what your body does for you so depending on what kind of body you're in what you're able to do but you know are you able to walk like 10 minutes down the road to the shops to buy a pint of milk or are you able to pick your children up? Are you able to give your partner a hug? And then it's focusing on the gratitude for, I'm so grateful for my arms because I can give my partner a hug. I'm so grateful for my strength to pick up my daughter, whatever it is. So I think there's a whole process in that. Um, and then there's also an amazing book, which I always recommend to people, which is quite a recent one, More Than a Body. Have you read oh, it? By hell Lindsay yes. and Lexi By the, the kite twins. Kite, yeah yes amazing yes, yes, it's amazing yes. so I think that's a really good part of the process of helping people understand like I love their phrase like your body's um an instrument not an ornament which I just think is just it speaks volumes in this area and and yes so there is still that issue of of weight you know weight gain or where people are at but I think what I found is when people go through this process of ditching diet culture realizing why they feel like they do and then starting to be a bit nicer to themselves that mindset piece there and then feeling gratitude even if they don't love some people never get to a place of body love but if you can get to a place of accepting your body then you're in just a better place all around like 
mental health wise and physical health wise as well. Yeah. Wow. And I'm glad you brought that book up because I had resistance reading that because I saw oh. the title. I kind of knew what the base of the book would be. And I refused to read it for, for a long time. I had it sat in my Audible and I was like, I'm not ready to listen to that yet. This was a while back now, but it's life changing because in my opinion, I posted this a few months ago. There's a choice. We can die it until we die. Mm. And you know what that's like if you're listening and watching this, like yeah. you're seeking help, which is I want to acknowledge each and every one of you for being here. Mm. So you can die it until you die or you can work through food freedom, body freedom, mm -hmm. both are hard and only yeah. one is worth it. And if you have to give up looking in the mirror and absolutely loving every single aesthetic part of the way your body looks, knowing that we're going to get older, our body yes. is going to change. We're going to have children, maybe. We might, God forbid, lose a leg or... Yeah our bodies are going to change. So we yeah. can either make peace with the fact that, you know what, my body's going to change and I accept it. And again, it's a journey. You can absolutely get to body acceptance and body neutrality, but what you gain in return with food freedom and having your life back and learning how to love yourself and leave the world of dieting behind it's indescribable, isn't it, Laura? What yeah, yes. Totally yeah. and utterly agree. Yeah. It's 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 incomparable actually, yes. because in one place you're you're in a place of fear of never enough, never worthy enough, never anything enough, never thin enough. Mm -hmm. But in another place, you're in a in a in a world of freedom where things are there's so much out there for you to achieve and for you to do. Yeah. Oh, I think that's a great note, a great note to end it. So can you share um, with our listeners where, well, first of all, how can they work with you? Like, do you do one-to-one? -one? Do you do group? Do you do both? All of the juice and I'll link it all below, of course, as well. Thank you. Yeah. So I do a lot of group. I do do a little bit of one-to-one -one work, but most people um, work with me in group, group coaching. Sorry, I'm <laughs> no, no worries. It's always the case you try not to cough and then you cough. Know, like, <laughs> um, and then um, if you want to kind of find out a little bit more about me and what I do, then a good place to start. I have a free masterclass, which is focused on food freedom. So it's my website, drlarazib.com forward slash masterclass. So you can check me out there. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your love. No worries. It's been so lovely to chat. It's been great to have you on. And if anyone wants to message you, can they message you on in Instagram? Are you Instagram's a great place to get hold of me. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Lara. And okay. bye everyone. See you next bye. episode. Bye. bye.